Dr. Nadal to your credit and Praxis, and uh, thanks for coming to the first Praxis event of the semester. We'll be having some more, but we'll announce those then. But uh, right now we have Dr. Ross Emmett speaking. Dr. Ross B. Emmett is Professor of Political Economy and Political Theory and Constitutional Democracy at James Madison College at Michigan State University. A story of economic thought, he is currently writing a biography of the Chicago economist Frank H. Knight, co-authoring a book on Robert Malthus, and planning a book on the history of the relation of economics and Christian theology since the 1830s. On his website, he says that his central concern is telling the history of constitutional political economy and the economists who have emphasized the role of the bourgeois virtues in free society. Professor Emmett believes Malthus is one of those economists and invites us to consider the case he makes for Malthus as a defender of free society today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ross Emmett. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have uh, known about Hillsdale College for a very long time and so uh, was pleased to be invited to actually speak. I've, also, I've been on the campus once already. Um, my, one of my friends in the economics department at Michigan State uh, and I uh, are bike riders, the pedal variety, not the room, room kind. And um, we, uh, we have made it an annual event every September uh, to ride to one of Michigan's liberal arts colleges. And so two years ago, um, we rode to Hillsdale from, you know, from MSU and entered campus right here next door at the, uh, the, the entrance to the campus, the uh, entrance there. The, Nice patio part, you know. You know, you know what the name is. I don't. And um, and toured the campus and got pictures sitting beside Lady Thatcher and all that kind of good stuff. And um, and then uh, one of our wives comes and picks us up and takes us home. <laughs> well, you know, 75 miles one way is 150 to both ways, and that's a little much. So, um, uh, but uh, so I've been here before. I uh, want to uh, begin um, today by suggesting, as uh, uh, Tyler said in the introduction, that we want to consider, my goal here today is to suggest to you that when you think about uh, Robert Malthus, you want to think about him in terms of his role in thinking about the nature of the civilization and the society within which economic uh, and other human activity uh, is pursued. And uh, this is a perspective on Malthus that is um, a little unusual because he's usually thought of primarily as a population theorist. Um, and uh, population theory tends to be really heavy on the biological side. And part of this is to argue that uh, there's more to thinking about population than just biology. And then um, as well, uh, in classical economic thought, Malthus has often been viewed from the standpoint of his debates with his good friend David Ricardo. And if those of you who did take um, history of economic thought may know that after Adam Smith, Malthus and Ricardo were the two inheritors of sort of the, um, the, the mantle of carrying classical economics forward. But David Ricardo is actually the one that the tradition of economics has focused on, and Malthus kind of fell off to the side on the sort of what we would today call macroeconomic view. Um, uh, I'm not, I don't actually believe there is such a thing as macroeconomics, so um, I'm a price theorist person. So um, I, I, if I sneer a little bit when I say macro, um, I think here I can probably get away with that. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> so, um, but um, the end part of uh, part of the message that I'm uh, sort of tr trying to convey is, in fact, that um, it's not only John Maynard Keynes who tried uh, who should try to recover Malthus, but uh, instead of for the reasons that Keynes did. Uh, we should try to recover Malthus because of what, because he actually is the bearer of the mantle of Adam Smith, not Ricardo. Uh, everyone thinks that Ricardo bears the mantle of Smith because Smith was about free trade. Smith was about way more than free trade. Smith was about constitutional political economy, the nature of the society, the nature of the institutions, the rules, the culture, the history the way things operated in the society, and, the, and a promoter of a free society. And it's Malthus who picks up that mantle. Ricardo picks up the mantle of free trade and begins the process of abstraction in economics and generates a kind of economics 
which is very different than the economics of Adam Smith and the economics of uh, Malthus. You may notice that I will use, um, there, there's Malthus right there, I will use Robert Malthus, his father called him Bob, his friends called him Robert, his first name was Thomas, but that was his first given name, and he went by Robert. So the friends of Malthus tend to call him Robert. So those of us who have been studying Malthus more recently, we tend to refer to him as Robert. And when you see someone write an article and they say, well, Thomas Malthus said, you know they're probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> because they have the standard story about Malthus and not the better story about Malthus. Um, by the way, if you haven't known this already, um, John Maynard Keynes went by Maynard, not John. So uh, it's an English tradition to have multiple given names, and which name gets picked is often a matter of uh, family choice and uh, personal choice in some cases. So um, my objective here today is to introduce you to some work I'm doing on Malthus, which uh, I think accounts for why both uh, how we can uh, how we can enter into thinking about Malthus's work, but also accounting for why some of the interpretations of Malthus that we find in the dominant literature have probably um, uh, had problems in interpreting Malthus's work. Um, and so I want to actually start with some of the things you usually hear about. And, um, and then proceed from those into my argument about Malthus. I'm not going to have time for all of these. Uh, so you can ask me about them later if you want to. Um, but um, I want to start with the ones near the top and then move on to my own presentation. And then uh, in questions, you can come back to some of these if you wish. Um, these are all things that you probably have heard or may have heard and that I would, uh, that are either wrong or I need to be changed in their emphasis by the way that we approach thinking about Malthus. And the, the first several on that list, maybe three for sure, all stem from a common conception that what Malthus um, was all about in his essay on population that was published in 1798 was about the notion that humans um, are not capable of constraining their biological uh, urges to reproduce and that they, they need to eat, but the power of population is greater than the power of the earth to sustain population, and hence, we're all going to die. Um, just kidding. Um, the, uh, but that uh, there is what was no long called and, and still is called the Malthusian trap. Right? that uh, the population will drive, uh, the, the, the growth of population will drive down subsistence, uh, drive down the, the wages or the lifestyle of people in a society to the edge of subsistence. And that that's sort of the state that, um, the reality of the world we live in. Um, the... We hear, that, we hear this story today in the people who identify themselves as Neo-Malthusians. And um, I'll give you two names that you probably have heard, uh, or you, you, the first one you may not have heard because it's an older name, but you probably have heard the second one. Uh, the first name is uh, Paul Ehrlich, author in the 1960s of a book called The Population Bomb. Um, and the second one is Garrett Hardin, whose essay, Tragedy of the Commons, is also um, a, a springs off of this Malthusian theme um, and suggests that all commons issues are ultimately tragic and, and, and necessitate either massive government intervention or um, or we're all going to die. So um, and um, Ehrlich's view was again also similar that we needed uh, without direct control of population we were going to have to we were going to face long-term problems as a human race. And so this kind of neo-Malthusian argument has been the dominant view of, of, of Malthus as well as of those who claim his mantle. <clears throat> and what I'm, one of the things I'm trying to do is shift uh, that away and say actually 
uh, the view that these people have is not Malthus's view, but they're entitled to view, to think what they want to think. And so, you know, I'm not trying to suppress their right to think what they want to think and argue what they want to think, but I want to argue that Malthus had a different argument. And I actually think that Malthus's argument is one that we need in some ways to recover parts of or that it supports a kind of argument that people are, who are often unwilling to refer to Malthus actually agree with. So I spent the summer at the Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman, Montana as a guest of the center uh, a long time ago now, 10 summers ago this coming summer. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. If, if any of you have an opportunity to attend their student colloquium, I strongly encourage you to do so. The advertisements for that just went up this week, and um, students are encouraged to apply um, to that. Uh, to the colloquium is a wonderful event. I wrote, I spent, the, they, they invited me out to tell them why they should like Malthus. And the very first day I was there, the executive director of the center had, uh, had something sitting on the printer, a piece of paper sitting on the printer, when I went to pick up my print job. So I picked up our papers, and I mistakenly picked up his too. And at the very top line, it said, Paul Ehrlich is the modern incarnation of Thomas Malthus. So I walked the piece of paper into Terry Anderson's office, and I said, Terry, by the time I leave here, I hope to convince you of two things. Number one, that Malthus's name is Robert, not Thomas. <laughs> And number two, that you are closer to the modern incarnation of, of Robert Malthus than Paul Ehrlich is. He was like, oh, okay, that would be interesting. And uh, he has toned down his rhetoric in use of, of Malthus's name <laughs> since that time um, as uh, he became convinced that at least Malthus didn't think what Paul Ehrlich thinks, um, whether or not uh, we can call it neo Malthusian or not. But, uh, you know, there's more to this story, right? Because um, this picture of the Malthusian trap suggests that ultimately human history is about resource uh, access and about um, disease, starvation, uh, pestilence, and warfare. And, um, and not about cooperation and competition and market exchange but ultimately about grabbing. In fact, it's about a Hobbesian world in which there is no possibility for trade. Um, and uh, another part of that picture then is that human beings really lack the capacity to resist their um, sexual desires. And hence, population will always um, be stronger than the powers of the earth to sustain it. Which, which suggests, and in Malthus's time, led to his, uh, the, the beginning of the condemnation of him by suggesting that um, what he was saying was that we can't do anything to help the poor. This became especially strong when he opposed the poor laws. Now, he opposed the poor laws because he thought that they did not give people incentives to be prudential in their thinking about childbearing. He thought that the poor laws were a set of policies which did not give people the right kinds of signals. <clears throat> That's a fairly common discussion among us about what government policy does. It gives the wrong kinds of signals. But the opponents of his viewpoint were like, you don't want to help the poor. And of course, the classic picture of this, and it is directly an attack on Malthus, is Dickens portrayal of Scrooge in his response to the two men who come asking for charity for the poor on Christmas Eve, right? And when, his, when Scrooge's response is, um, you know, all right, don't we still have the poor houses? Well, yes, but they're so horrible. Okay, that's bad. I agree. Um, but then um, Scrooge says, surplus population, let them die. And that's the view of what Malthus thought. That isn't Malthus's own view, but that was the view of what Malthus thought. And um, the early interpretation of Malthus shares with the modern interpretation this view of Malthus as being uncaring and of people who, 
who, who admire Malthus as being uncaring about the life of the poor. Um, many of you have already figured out that there is a difference between directly helping someone and indirectly helping someone. And sometimes directly helping someone may actually have um, bad consequences. And that indirect systems may provide greater support for individual responsibility in the exercise of individual freedom and the promotion of your own interests and, and ultimately perhaps the, the satisfaction of goals that society would like to see as well. But, um, but here we have it you know, directly because people could thought that Malthus was being um, unkind to the poor because he w wouldn't support laws that would directly give poor people things because he understood that you want to create a cultural context within which people have reasons to make decisions about their, their lives which come with certain kinds of signals. So the others of these things, oh, and of course the technological improvement, one of the other ones you always hear is, well, the big problem with Malthus is he didn't think that, any, that technology would solve all these problems. And I'm like, <coughs> you like Adam Smith. Adam Smith didn't think that anything more about technology than Robert Malthus did. Why not? What happens to world GDP and standard of living after 1800? Right? You've seen the chart, the hockey stick. <coughs> I have some doubts about that hockey stick nowadays, but I'm, I'm not yet willing to challenge my good friend Deirdre McCloskey on, on that. Um, so, but, um, but, but, Malthus lived right before 1800. Human experience before 1800, especially before 1750, was flat. So I don't expect Adam Smith and Robert Malthus to know about technology the things we know about technology today. Uh, but I do think that both of them promoted the kind of society that gave us those technological advances without realizing that it would. And so I'm not as, uh, I don't view Malthus's views on this as problematic. Uh, but, so what we end up with is this Malthus that uh, Robert Heilbronner called um, a person who had gloomy presentiments about the world. Um, or um, the, the, the notion that, many people believe that the economics is called the dismal science because, it, um, because of Malthus. That's actually wrong. Thomas Carlyle called economics the dismal science because it promoted the emancipation of black people. That's why it's called the dismal science, because Thomas Carlyle actually wanted to, um, well, um, either re-enslave or eliminate the African population in the Americas. Um, so, uh, and so Carlyle attacked uh, economics along with evangelical Christians for promoting um, the emancipation of um, Africans in the Americas. Um, and uh, so, but many people think it's about Malthus because Malthus gives us a dismal view of the world. Malthus is the person who really helps us see that there's always a cause. Everything is about trade-offs, which is, by the way, a good thing, but that a good realization, but sometimes people don't want to hear that. Okay, so now let me turn to what the positive side. <clears throat> so here's what I want to say. So over the course of the last, well, it's really almost 20 years, it's more years than you want to hear, more years than many of you have been alive. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, been thinking about Malthus and um, gradually sort of figuring out how, to, how I thought about it. And in the last couple of years, um, it dawned on me that the way I wanted to express this idea was the following, that <clears throat> at, when Malthus wrote his famous essay on population, he was trying to find a way to express his dissatisfaction with the ideas of an English philosopher, William Godwin, who was echoing the kinds of arguments that were being made in France about liberty, 
justice, and the third word is fraternity. Those of you who live here only know of fraternities as a place where all kinds of things happen. Um, and, um, and so I tend to use uh, my own translation of the word fraternity uh, into English as communal benevolence. Um, the, the, the notion in French of fraternity meant a sort of a, a benevolence towards each other. A sense that we are all in this together and we're going to, to get through it. So uh, liberty, equality, and communal benevolence. And, um, and Godwin was arguing that we needed a, he couldn't quite say we needed a French Revolution in England, A, because, um, and B, because um, uh, look what had happened to the French Revolution. But he was like, oh, the spirit of, you know, the spirit of this kind of idea, this Rousseauian theme about um, how institutions degrade us and corrupt us and make us unequal. Look at England, we're unequal. We're corrupt and look at the, you know, you think political cartoons today are funny? Go look at the political cartoons about George III. The ones with him riding the back of his mistress like a horse. You think, you think our political cartoons are, you know, problematic? Okay. Um, and, um, and, and, and Godwin's message had struck a chord. The, Jacob, the, the Jacobin tradition was quite strong in England. This is, the, after all, the kind of people that Thomas Jefferson liked to read and liked to interact with, right? Uh, and, and Thomas Paine, who was a member of this tradition, who uh, has a significant role in the American Revolution, if <coughs> he fell out of favor after that, when he kind of went French on everybody. But uh, he did, um, the rights of man. Um, and um, so um, it's in that context that Malthus writes the essay. And he, he and his father, his, Malthus's father was, um, a country gentleman, not rich, not super rich, but obviously up to scale from, you know, the bottom. And um, he was friends with David Hume, had met Rousseau, and they were reading Godwin's book, and, and he and his son started arguing. His son had recently graduated from Cambridge, was a young cleric. He, um, Thomas Robert Malthus is the Reverend Thomas Robert Malthus. And he was a young cleric, and he and his father were arguing. And they were both fairly... Um, sympathetic to these kind of arguments, but Robert had this idea in his head that there was something that bugged him. And he and his father were arguing, and one day his father says to him, you know, what you just said, that's really good. Why don't you write that down? And so he did. He sat at home, out in the country, with almost, well, with a really good library, but not all the books he wanted, and wrote out this argument. He wrote it in a fairly short span of time. And he spelled it out. And the argument he spelled out was deliberately designed to counter the argument that Godwin presented. Godwin presented the argument that if we got rid of the monarchy, got disestablished the church, that is, got rid of, well, created a wall of separation between church and state. And, um, and well, for some strange reason, got rid of marriage. Uh, does anybody happen to know who William Godwin's daughter is? What? Mary Shelley. Mary, no, yeah, Mary Shelley. She was Mary Godwin. She became Mary Shelley when she married Pierce, and she wrote the novel Frankenstein, Frankenstein okay? which is about the same stuff. But. <coughs> and who was her mother? Mary Wollstonecraft, who died in childbirth and only married Godwin when they got pregnant. Well, she got pregnant. <laughs> um, and because they were actually both in favor of free love and no marriage. And so part of Godwin's world is get rid of marriage. So get rid of marriage, get rid of the church, get rid of, uh, of uh, the monarchy and the state, and get rid of private property, which Malthus understood to mean get rid of markets. And, or at least any kind of organized markets. And... Um, and Godwin's trying, and Mal the Malthuses are trying to figure out this argument, and Malthus comes up with this, this argument. Now, in that context, what Malthus comes up with is a very simple argument. I'm going to give you the, um, the basics of it here.
Okay. He, this is right at the. Oops. You're not getting what I have. Okay, there we go. Um, I think I may make fair, I may fairly make two postulata. These are the famous uh, beginning of the thing. That food is necessary, that the passion between the sexes is necessary. These two laws appear to have been fixed laws of our nature. Now, notice what he's saying. He's saying, you know, if we strip away from us humans everything that civilizes us, everything that provides a civilizing effect on our lives, what do we end up with? We end up with a biological creature. This biological creature is, in fact, no different than the deer who wander the lawns of Malthus's home, or rabbits. They are biological agents with two desires, to eat and to reproduce. And then, the force of the argument is this one up here. The power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce sustenance for man. So he's like, OK, yeah, we have these two urges, but the because of the geometric ratio thing, the power of population is going to overwhelm the power of the earth. Notice that this is not an empirical proposition about human society. Because there can be no human society which fits this description. Because every human society has some element of civilizing effects. In fact, part of what I'm trying to do here is to suggest that Malthus is ultimately a theorist about civilization and the role of civilization on people. Now, civilization is a bad word sometimes these days. But it was a big word back in Malthus's time. In fact, the word first entered the dictionary in the 1760s. The word civilization doesn't appear much before this. And what does, what, 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 you know, remember the way I said it? The civilizing effect. The crucial thing about civilizing effects is that they're the things that restrain us. So civilization is about the things that restrain us. And by restraining us, give us the capacity to create something really interesting to create surpluses that allow art and allow music and allow our life together. C create, by constraining us, create the potential for us to have markets in which we exchange and then begin to innovate. By constraining us, allow us to have families. And so the civilization and restraint and constraint are all mixed together. <coughs> but he says, so he says, population, when unchecked, does the following. But where in human society is civilization actually unchecked? Nowhere. I call this the rabbit theory of population. And what do ecologists tell you? Animals consume up to the carrying capacity of the, the land on which they, um, in which they live. We talk about the carrying capacity of an ecological environment. Exactly. How much food is there for the population? And they consume, they, they produce up to the limits of the ecological carrying capacity. This is no different than what modern ecology teaches us about how animals live. But Malthus says, humans are a peculiar animal. Because humans have something that animals don't. Reason and foresight. And reason and foresight allow us to think about our future and to try to civilize ourselves in order to have a different future. <clears throat> now that, so my argument is, and has been, that this uh, description is not an empirical proposition. It doesn't generate a model which should have empirical results. Instead, it's a thought experiment. It was in the first place a thought experiment intended to demolish Oh, there we go. Cool. To demolish Godwin. Because Godwin's argument was, and you have to follow me here, because these ups and downs matter. Godwin's argument was that the, that the status quo in England involved a set of repression, repressive institutions. And if we got rid of these repressive institutions, the things would get better. And indeed, might approach an ideal world. A world, liberty, and equality. But 
what Malthus says is, he says, oh, he says, that's so beautiful. I just wandered for days thinking how wonderful this <coughs> dream was. And then it dawned on me that in the field that I was wandering in, there were all kinds of animals freely procreating. And uh, it dawned on me that Godwin's vision of society was like the perfect recipe for massive population growth. So he's like, he said, look, I'm not saying that the institutions of modern society, of modern England, modern in the 1700s, uh, are, are great. I'm not saying that they're perfect. I actually think that maybe Godwin has a point. If we got rid of them, things might get a little better. But Godwin's vision, by removing all of the civilizing effects upon us, would lead to a world that was a perfect recipe for population growth and hence begin to plunge us downward. Now, if you know Edmund Burke's book on, um, on the reflection of the French Re Revolution, you will know that Burke projected that the French Revolution would take us into a state of nature, like a Hobbesian state of nature in which we'd all kill each other. And everybody's go, oh, that's the reign of terror. Yeah, that's a good prediction. Um, but, um, but Malthus says, ah, but my humans aren't necessarily going to have to plunge into the state of nature before anything happens. For all you future lawyers, Hobbes has a great name for your future law firm. Good morning, nasty poor, brutish and short. How can I help you? <laughs> um, and I've known at James Madison College, which is a college that sends a lot of people to law school, I'm known as the anti-law school professor. <laughs> and so uh, that's part of my uh, or blah. So, um, Malthus argued that instead of plummeting downward into the state of nature where everything was abysmal, that humans, that we would all, sitting around, you know, we'd, we'd get into a room like this and we he actually says, we'd call a convention. And, you know, this is written, this is written five years after, no, sorry, 11 years after the American Constitutional Convention. I can't help but that he was thinking about the first written constitution in the world, the American Constitution, and the Constitutional Convention in which a group of people sat down and said, let's have a convention and let's set some basic rules and set the constitutional parameters of government, uh, create, allow government to function, but also to set its constraints. And he says, they would, first of all, the first thing that they would do, they'd all sit down and go, hang on a second, we gotta reinstitute property rights. We gotta create some kind of property rights. Then the second thing they'd say is, uh, it's gonna also be really important that we figure out a way to make fathers financially responsible for the children they sire. Now, that's at the bottom line what Malthus wants out of marriage. Now, of course, he thinks that marriage is significantly more than that. And um, as a Christian pastor, he's very concerned about all the more of marriage. But for economically, at the bottom line, you need a mechanism in society which ensures that fathers are financially responsible for the children they sire. And in, in most societies that we are familiar with, that's marriage. And with those in place and with some governance as well, we could begin to see them progress economically and socially but via the institutions of a free society. In fact, the institutions he spells out are what we would call the institutions of a free society. Now, he having, having I'm just checking the clock here, having said this in the first essay, when the book actually sold a lot, in fact, he didn't even put his name on the first essay because he was like, I don't want to go down in flames. Um, when the book sold a lot, um, he had the opportunity to do a little bit of travel and to begin to revise his argument. And so once he had, in a sense, dispensed with Godwin, once he had gotten Godwin out of his system, 
the thought experiment became a different um, project. The thought experiment became a means of evaluating different societies on the extent to which their degree of civilization enabled them to control human population without war, pestilence, famine, disease. That is, to the extent that preventive checks, social constraints on population, came to be super important. And he began a process of constructing what I call a comparative political economy. In fact, I would argue that uh, even more than Smith, he's the first person to really begin the project of comparative political economy where you look at the institutions and social mores and nature of the society and ask, what is the product of, the, of that society, of that, for him, that civilization? And so in a recent paper, again, now we've got to wait. And there we go. Yeah, there we go. In a recent paper, um, I have this spectrum. And um, this sort of popped out at me when I was at, back in Bozeman at Perk. Uh, because I was reading the subsequent editions of the essay, and it, I, it dawned on me that the, the, these are actually like the titles of the chapters of the second and third parts of the volumes of, of the subsequent editions of the essay. And it starts here with a society in societies where the positive checks, by, by the way, he uses the word positive in the way that scientists use the word positive science. That is, it's natural. It's, it's nature at work. He would, he's been criticized about this, right? Because he says, people say, oh, Malthus thinks that disease and war and starvation are positive. No, he thinks that they're awful things, and, but that they're natural effects. And just like positive and normative are used, right? He's using positive in that, in that kind of sense. So the positive checks of all those bad things um, are, are operate at this end of the spectrum. And, um, and so you know, he says, Terra del Fuego, they can, hardly, they can hardly keep families together. Where's Terra del Fuego? Good little geography lesson. The very south of the Southern America. Yeah? yeah. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah. 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 Right at the very end, bottom of South America. In fact, all of these places, interestingly, are um, in the southern part of the southern hemisphere. Um, by the way, he didn't visit Terra del Fuego. He was relying upon travelers' reports. That's the empirical evidence that they had in the 1700s, which were people who traveled to places and wrote about what life was like there. That was the, the kind of empirical evidence they had. Um, it, he would probably have different kinds of empirical evidence today, doing his work, but he, that, that was the kind of stuff they had. And I, I realized as I was reading the essays that in fact, the greater the degree of civilization, the less operative the positive checks are. In fact, he says, it may be possible that someday there will be a society which is so civilized that only prudential and moral features of society control population. And that the positive checks play no role in it whatsoever. You might say that the world we live in, and certainly a large a, a portion of the world we live in, has begun to reach that level for the majority of its populations. But in his own time, he didn't have any populations that. He thought of England, it's not going to show up now, but he thought of England over, over there to the far right as sort of the most advanced civilization of his time. That is, notice what's important for him about civilization. The most advanced civilization because it enables its people to escape more than any other the effects of the positive checks. And hence, to be able to have the civilizing effects allow a level of prosperity that can't be matched in the other places. If you wanted to put this in, for those of you who are game theory people, you could think about this in terms of the law, the shadow of the future. 
um, the notion to what extent in the society to the left of your screen, to what extent can the future really play a role on your present actions? You don't know if you're going to live past the next couple days. You're scratching out your existence on the rocks um, at the southern end of South America. Um, and uh, there's no future. To, you can't make plans about the future. Whereas as we move along this spectrum, you can begin to make plans about the future. And some of those plans are about your fertility choices. And contrary to the church and contrary to a lot of other um, aspects of his society, Malthus's main policy argument was we want institutions that encourage people to delay marriage. Now, let me be clear about this, because many of you will say, oh, well, hang on, we don't want to delay marriage. Um, and uh, uh, he means marrying at, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, okay? Uh, he doesn't mean marrying at 21, 22. Tw delaying marriage to 21, 22 would be a good thing in his point of view. Uh, delaying marriage to 30, which is sort of a, a very common today, 28 to 30 is a, a you know, finally, you, know, you should get married now. Um, that would be incredible for him uh, if, if a large portion of society uh, adopted that policy uh, uh, sort of framework. Uh, and of course, um, most of you would not be here in Malthus's world. Most of you, well, first of all, most of you would be past middle age because the average life expectancy in Malthus's time was 30 years. So most of you would be entering the last 10 years of your life. Although if you had lived to 20, there's a very good chance that you were going to live to at least 60. So that's, you know, the, the, death, the, the average lifespan is heavily influenced by the infant mortality rates of the time, right? And, uh, but, uh, and, you know, almost all the women in the room would have had babies by now. Probably, I, I say babies, not just a baby, because it would be plural. And most of the men would be working, and you would not be in the school, because you didn't have the means to be in school. My, my parent, my, not my parents, but my great, great grandfather um, was a sweatshop worker in uh, New Hampshire, in, in uh, Massachusetts. And, uh, my, my lineage, despite my, the fact that my lineage goes back to the earliest days of the American um, experience, um, much of that was not um, a wealthy American experience, but a wor uh, working class American experience. And um, I certainly would not have had many opportunities to plan and think about my future in the kind of ways that um, people in Malthus's uh, place in society. Malthus, by the way, did not marry young. He married at the age of 38 after the second volume of his book was published, which was sold very well. And at the same time, he was also given a permanent position in the church. And he also became a professor, of, the very first professor of economics in England. So uh, financially stable, he finally married the woman he had been engaged to for 13 years. And they had three children, not 13. Three. All of them survived. Well, they had three surviving children of infancy. I'm not exactly positive if he had any that died in infancy. Um, let, me, let me just take a moment to show you how on this spectrum he used this discussion about civilization to a good effect in thinking about the way he distinguished between societies. And my favorite example is the difference between Norway and Sweden. And even though Sweden is on the right-hand side, um, Malthus had a passion for Norway. And that's partly because Malthus grew up in the country in a pastoral setting. His father had purchased a an, um, part of an estate that actually belonged um, the guy who financed William Wilberforce's uh, uh, opposition to slavery and the slave trade was Henry Thornton, who was an economist of some note, a monetary theorist. Are any of you reading about Thornton? You might have heard about Thornton. Um, and uh, Thornton's father 
owned a lot of property, and the, the Malthuses actually bought part of the property of the, of the, um, the Thorntons. That was where, where he grew up. And so Malthus had grown up in the country. He kind of liked the pastoral life. He, he sort of thought that urban manufacturing was kind of dirty and gross, and had a sort of predilection for pastoral life. And, and Norway was more like the kind of place he would like than Sweden, which had a, a more industrial and urban base. But um, so Malthus compares these two societies side by side. Societies with similar heritages, societies that are quite similar in their, um, their you know, um, structure, backgrounds, etc. And he says they have very different consequences. And it's very interesting. He said in Norway, um, there's far fewer um, infant deaths, and there's a lot more late marriages. Why is that the case? And he says, well, here's the thing. In Norway, every single male has to go through conscription. What well, you Americans, I'm an American and a Canadian, um, would call the draft. I never had to register for the draft, by the way. I'm one of the very rare Americans born in a period. The draft, the selective service was shut down on the first of the month in which I turned 18. So there was no selective service when I turned 18. And it was restarted when I was 26. So I never had to register for the draft. But Norway had mandatory conscription. And of course, like America, if you went, when they had the draft, um, if you didn't um, fit the bill, you were excused. But that often meant that you had to do other things in place of, um, uh, of going to, to the military. And the conscription was for 10 years at the age of 18. And the whole society had bought into this. So the Norwegian church, which is Lutheran, I, I'm pretty sure the Norwegian church is Lutheran. Yeah, I know it's Lutheran. Um, the Norwegian church is Lutheran. The, the Lutheran church had bought in to the conscription message and urged people who were not conscripted to not get married as a support for their brethren, because they were all male, who could not get married because they were conscripted in the military. You could only get married once you were conscripted if you had your superior officer's permission to get married, and how likely was that to happen? So marriage came late, significantly delayed, at least until you were well after old, older than 20 in Norway. Furthermore, in much of the countryside, young people would go to work at the great houses, Downton Abbey. Okay? Mm -hmm. The great houses. <laughs> as servants in the great houses. And servants weren't allowed to fraternize, right? um, as you know from Downton Abbey. And uh, <laughs> Downton Abbey's great, right? I mean, it's a great show to have around right now because there's all kinds of lessons you can use that for because everybody knows something about that. Um, for example, Adam Smith's Great Proprietor uh, chapter, uh, book four, chapter, or book three, yeah. Anyway, it's a chapter about improvement, how improvements in the, in the town help improvements in the countryside. It, if you just think Downton Abbey, you can understand it quite, quite well. The great proprietor who throws parties for all his people, and then all of a sudden, he's all, all he's interested in is what's happening in London, and the parties in London, and things for his wife so he, and daughter so he can buy in London, and the people are free to improve themselves. Freed from their Lord's generosity, they're free to pursue their own designs. It's a wonderful chapter. Uh, it's a direct attack on Rousseau. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful chapter. I love it. Um, and, uh, but Norway had, so Norway's good effects for Malthus are the product of these right, features of society that Sweden doesn't have. And so um, um, for Malthus, this is the kind of comparative analysis he does. What are the institutions of the society? How do they affect decisions about marriage and about other things that matter for thinking about the way society operates? This is pretty much where I stop. And um, 
So the, the overarching message I have is that Malthus's vision is that the arguments about population are, they are definitely the center of his attention, but they take his attention not just to the biology and ecology of, uh, of, uh, of the biological aspect of our lives, but to a cons consideration of what we would today call the constitutional political economy of society, the nature of the institutions and of the rules and of the incentives and of the mores and of the, um, uh, what Ostrom's vision of how social norms work and all those kinds of things, and even more, sort of the general feel of the culture and the way the roles that those have play over time in the culture, creating the kind of environment in which human decisions are made. What he, what he hoped for were, was a civilization that led you to think about fertility decisions as opposed to be forced right, by the force of your circumstances into other things. Um, and so, uh, and that's, that's I, I can respond more in questions. So I'll stop and let you uh, ask questions. I think we have seven minutes for questions. I got a little long-winded at the very end, my apologies. Yes? So, these preventive checks that you talk about in our future of, of civilization, um, what was Malthus's take on how a society adopts those? Um, did, he, did he have any ideas on that? Um, he tends to look at the, the long term. So, for example, um, the societies in here, which are more often the pastoral nations of Africa, so North Africa, he, talk, he says, you know, they actually have a lot of resources at their disposal that they could use to develop their society. But they're held back by this long history of the Bedouins of, war, of warfare. We call them warlords today, right? Of tribal warfare. And that long heritage of tribal warfare uh, and, and, he says, he says, and the way in which they treat their women as prizes to be won and taken in battle. Um, as um, that these things lead these nations to, uh, to not be able to reach the steps that they could take if they could curtail those habits. He actually calls them the habits of war. Mm. And so this notion that there's habitual behavior in culture, that societies become like certain, certain ways of being, um, and, and whether you, you know, Somebody today might say, oh, that sounds like Hayek's evolutionary paths or something like that. Um, that of course, Hayek went around. Um, but the, the, the notion that history matters, and it matters for Smith, it, it matters for Malthus. And that um, you, you can't just talk, you can't just willy-nilly change institutions, change the civilizing effects just like that and produce positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to work at it. But he's very interested in com the comparisons and how different, and a lot of what's interesting about this, the, the study he does is the different kinds of effects he sees. So he doesn't look and ask, what are their property right regimes and how do they differ across all the nations? He's like, what really matters in this nation is their conscription. What really matters over here is uh, the way in which they have developed their communal life within a, 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 a village. Um, you know, so he, he features different aspects of society for different ones. It doesn't have sort of a standardization of a, a long spectrum of property right regimes or whatever else we would do. Does that help answer? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in regards to, excuse me, uh, any precursors to Malthus, would you say Richard Candelon possibly do something? Well, so Candelon, um, by the way, I want to write a novel about Candelon. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. He's quite a rogue. And, um, um, and um, he, he uh, survived his um, uh, attempted suicide. Uh, uh, it wasn't actually, he faked his, his death in order to escape his debts uh, to those he had swindled by his investments in the stock markets. Um, so he's not, I mean, he might be an icon. Uh, I, I went to the talk called uh, The First Austrian Economics Was an Irishman. 
um, uh, uh, on Candelon. And, um, and, and so, you know, he, despite his positive views of certain things, you know, he, he, he played. He was a player. And, well, or as, what's the singer who says, I love the players, you love the game. Well, that's Taylor Swift. Um, <laughs> it just dawned on me. Of course that's who it is. Um, that, that is such a great game theory model. <laughs> For those of you who teach game theory, she says, I love the players, you love the game. Wow. That's Candle. That, that's Candle. I teach game theory, and the, student, the students look at me. I force them to play Prisoner's Dilemma for grades. Um, and, so, and they're like, you love the game. I did not damn it. So, uh, okay. <clears throat> so, um, the, uh, so Candle on, Candle on. Yes, in some regards, but Cantillon's attention is really on the financial markets, on the sort of monetary systems. And that's not the side of Malthus that I focused a lot on. So I can't go a lot in detail on how Cantillon and Malthus are connected. That's short. Yeah. I guess kind of what you were just saying at the end there. But what exactly, when Malthus was saying that we, like the incentive to move from positive checks to preventative checks, was he looking at it more from a social, sociological term as like improving quality of life or more of an economic incentive to improve well, so subsistence? We don't, you know, we don't really have, before Adam Smith, a conception of economic improvement that is something like what we think of today very easily when we talk about standard of living, when we talk about um, GDP or, you know, oh, GDP is an improper measure, we should have some other measure. Um, you know, the, the real measure before that was how rich is your king? If you lived in a country with a rich king, you were doing well. Because that king could give you lots of great stuff, including peace and long life. So, right? so uh, and, and Malthus is, like Smith, breaking that down. But is there, you know, is there a measure? I don't, I don't have, that's part of the problem. This, I can't, I, okay, I'm not a modeler. Somebody probably could put this into a model, try it, let me know what to do with it. But I don't have, you know, a degree of civilization predicts, you know, increased GDP or, you know. He does think that it projects increased surplus for society because he operates on a kind of Smithian conception of how the economy works. But he's really more concerned about all the other things. This is why he's often viewed as a problem um, economist for, um, for, especially for free traders. You may know that um, for a while he opposed um, Ricardo's, um, let me put it a different way, for a while Malthus was in favor of the Corn Laws. Um, he actually, uh, we have learned that he retracted his opinion um, and changed his mind and fully agreed with Ricardo um, eventually on that, on that particular one. But people have said, well, he, you know, he really liked landlords. You know, and, uh, and, and you can kind of get that sense from his notion he has a pastoral sort of vision. And, uh, but but you, it's not unidimensional. Well, if there are no further questions, we are supposed to get out of five, and it's just there. Uh, there's going to be an afterglow, and AJ's immediately followed.